Okay, here. Okay, it's 631. This seems like a good time to start. It's hard to read a digital room, but um, we'll give it a shot. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. For those who don't know me, I'm Anthony Elms, uh, Brett Daniel, sometime chief curator at the ICA. And we'll be talking tonight with Karen Olivier, a wonderful sculptor whose show is, was, not sure, on view at the ICA. Um, currently, everything that's alive moves. And we're going to give a, I guess, hopefully like 45 or so minute talk conversation. And we will be, if people would like to ask questions, we ask that you type them in the chat and they will be collated and sort of given to me towards the end to be able to um, sort of read them through and talk to them just to make things clearer. It's also uh, cleaner if people can mute their sound and their video so that it's uh, only Karen and I will be uh, 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 audible. For the, those who request it, we do have an ASL interpreter and you can find the name in the corner is ASL. You can always pin her video or double click her video to make it larger if that's a service you need. We will also be having a slideshow and you can sort of pin that to make it larger or minimize it if you desire. And either direct way, we've made the images possible for viewing through a Google Drive. So you can choose them at your own pace, speed, if you need to look at things. To also give you some grounding for the ICA, we are starting to sort of look through some digital programming that will be uh, forthcoming. So beginning June 10th and every Wednesday until July 29th, we will be unrolling one by one our open video call artists, eight artists. So each individual artist will be featured a particular Wednesday in a conversation and a screening of their works. And this was this year's rendition of Open Video Call was done in collaboration with the local group Lino Kino. And so you can always um, sort of look forward to that and sort of then also check the videos online as they're unfolding through the website. And for tonight, I just guess I need to thank um, the, the wonderful power trio of Derek Ribby, Natalie Sandstrom, and Ali Motion. Uh, who all contributed some degree in making this happen and very thankful for all of their efforts to sort of keep me legit. So with that, uh, yeah, originally Karen and I were not going to do a conversation. Um, this was not originally planned of our, uh, one of our talks, but as the reality of the world unfolding or unwinding or unraveling, whichever way you like to think about it. We thought it might be good to just go through and talk through the pieces. And so we'll sort of be having this conversation as you walked, let's say, as you walk through the space, as you walk through the, the galleries. So uh, for those who did not have a chance to visit, this is as you enter the exhibition. This is sort of the opening wall text, brochures, all that. Oh, and I guess I will have to notion those of you will be noticing that I puncture my my talking with slide uh, to make sure that Derek is advancing the images. <laughs> so with this, um, Derek, slide. So if you came to the museum, the first thing that you might see um, coming to our visitors service desk would be someone offering you instead of the typical museum badge, a um, red carnation of which I couldn't find one. So I tried to make one out of office paper and colored pencil uh, this afternoon. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, so the pieces, um, and then once you entered the space, you would see a wall label that said May 12th, 1985. So maybe um, Karen, talk about why May 12th, 1985. Okay, I guess for starter, well, thanks for everyone for coming. It's beautiful out. So I appreciate you being indoors when you could be socially distancing out in a park or something. Um, so May 12, 1985, I knew I wanted to do a work that 
um, spoke or made reference to MOVE. Um, MOVE is about three miles, they were located about three miles up. They were a Black liberation group. Um, Slide. Um, they, caught, they had periodic run-ins, confrontation, confrontations with the police. Mm -hmm. um, there was violence, a lot of violence involved as well. I, I won't go into too much detail, but the most, I guess, profound um, confrontation was on May 12, 1985, they, ser they served warrants, arrest warrants and eviction notices to the MOVE members. And they also asked everyone who lived in the neighborhood, they had to evacuate until the following evening. So on May 13th, the following day, slide, the police come, um, they demand that they leave and the MOVE members don't. So a police helicopter drops a bomb on their compound. Um, and the famous words that rang after were, let, let the fire burn. So the result was 11 MOVE members were killed, were murdered. Um, 65 houses in the neighborhood in that area, vicinity were, were destroyed. So I wanted to do a piece that made reference to that, but spoke about the day before. So what does it mean that the day before is Mother's Day? It's a day of, Slide. it could be a day of remembering if you've lost a mother, it could be a day of celebration, a day of beauty. But while that was happening, that neighborhood, at the same time, they're realizing those folks had to like evacuate. So I could see it being this bittersweet day. So I was thinking, how could I kind of address the move bombing, but not actually sit in the place of pain and, and suffering? What would it mean for it to be in this position the day before when there was a day of joy potentially and or day of love and a day of the day before everything turned to shit before the horror happened um and i was thinking about what would it mean for me to make a memorial that's minute a memorial that's ephemeral uh, a memorial that can fit in your hand i was thinking about you know a lot of churches on mother's day They'll give you a, a red flower carnation if your mother's alive and a white one if your mother's passed. So I wanted to kind of stay in that space of that history in churches, but I also wanted to think about that. I could talk about the history of Mother's Day. We can go to the next slide. Yeah, slide. Ann Jarvis, a, a West Virginian woman who moved to Philadelphia, and she led a national charge to make Mother's Day a national holiday. Um, by 1914, it was a federal holiday, and she chose a carnation as the the, the flower for the holiday, it was her mother's favorite flower. And so I thought this layered histories of Mother's Day, founded in Philadelphia, you have Mother's Day 1985 being the day before the tragedy happened. So I thought it'd be interesting to align it, but I was also thinking about other pieces that kind of function as these memorials that are dispersed. I was thinking about the um, stumbling stones in, well, it's throughout Europe where these brass, plaques are put in front of the homes of victims and um, um, folks killed during the Nazi regime. So you find, so they, they actually say that's the most dispersed memorial that exists. And I was also thinking even about an art piece like something like Paul Ramirez Jonas, his uh, key to the city. So you have this key that was symbolic, but it was a key that was actually literal, it actually had a value and a use. So I was thinking, what would it mean for me to make a piece that while you're in the museum together, you're a community, there's some acknowledgement of a, a, a certain memory or a certain t um, position in time. But also, if you don't have a memory of Mother's Day in that way, in terms of flower, everyone has some high association. I know in Jamaica, it's, it's the funerary flower that's used. Um, proms, it's the cheesy flower to prom. So I like that it could be, you could have your own personal recognition, but while you're in the museum at that time, it kind of represents like right now we're a community acknowledging and recognizing this. Um, slide. Okay, so now to introduce the show and maybe introduce you a little bit. I mean, you are a sculptor and we've been talking for maybe, I guess, eight years off and on, off and on, and um, intertwining here and there. And in the last, what, four years, you've been really invested in public space and particularly in monuments. And as we started thinking about a show actually happening, you were thinking of this play of like monument, memorial. You were going to Rome to study and to look at ruins and to think through maybe memorials and monuments in a different sort of manner. And then this is the, the 
latest piece that you made or the newest piece you made, whichever way we uh, are wording it. And so I guess for me, I'm like, it's very, it's very easy to see how like the, the flower, the carnation for Mother's Day is a memorial. Like, am I also a monument when I'm wearing this? Do I become a monument? Is there a monument aspect to all of us dispersed? Yeah, I'm always thinking about monuments and how we know about why and how monuments fail. I think it's partly because of materiality. It's partly because of the way we don't gather around them. And it, that could be partly tied to its weightiness, its permanence. I keep thinking that the best monument, I always go back to the Vietnam War Memorial, why that monument works is because of that shiny black surface you see yourself reflected. As you're seeing the names of those who are lost, you're seeing yourself, you're seeing your history, you're seeing the past and a future, and you're very in the present moment. So I feel like when you're seeing that reflection, you become the monument. So what does it mean for a monument, for you to have to do some of the memory work for a monument? What does it mean for you to, for it to be really, if it's about honoring, honoring and commemorating, what are the histories that we're honoring and commemorating? They're always going to be complex and layered. So what does it mean for me to have to get the knowledge to understand mm -hmm. that? But what does it mean if, the, if I become the monument, what is my responsibility to citizenship? What is my responsibility to my community? What is my responsibility to myself? And I think when we start to think about monuments existing in different ways, the fact they could exist in this minute way, but it also could exist it, at the same time, it's also ephemeral or in the wall piece we'll get to where it's, actually not, it's porous, it's not solid, it's not static, it's not, it's not station, it's, it can't, it could easily be not stationary. All of a sudden I'm thinking like, what would it mean for monuments to not, to not be reliant on its materiality, but to rely on monuments and morals relying on our gathering together. Our gathering is what imbues it with power. I mean, I, got, I mean, that's nice because I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot and I love to repurpose things. I'm always reading and taking things perhaps out of context, in context. And there's a Canadian poet, Lisa Robertson, who writes a lot about being public, you know, being social. I love her language. I love what she concentrates on. And in an older book of poetry uh, called Lisa Robertson's Magenta Whip, there's a line in one of the poems that says, we are complicity's monuments. And I have to admit, there's a part of me that hates that this piece was curtailed because what I like about thinking through the flowers as a monument is, what, a couple of weeks ago, what, a week ago, uh, there were still articles in the paper about whether or not the city of Philadelphia should apologize for the move bombing. And so like, as long as we're still having to have this conversation of whether or not we should apologize, we as people who live here are whether we agreed with the policy or whether we were even here when it happened, we are complicit somehow in, in a system that still decides it has to have this as a living question as opposed to a decided known ethics or responsibility that we had to take. Yeah, that's why I, I, I like that the flower could, people could have their personal remembrances of it or associations, but at the end of the day, what does it mean for us to tie this to a time what does it mean for us to have to consider this history and it wasn't the first time a black um community was burned down and it won't be the last so what does it mean that we're living in a time where we still have to talk about black lives matter what is it so it's like in a way we're all witnesses we all have a responsibility we all can't deny it and i feel so we have to keep these memorials are in a way forcing us not even forcing us, they make us acknowledge a thing that is constantly in your periphery until it hits you straight on, like the <laughs> pandemic and the issues that we see with privilege and access. All of a sudden now, this thing that's over there that you know, all of a sudden, the bullseye is there. So what does it mean for me to have this thing that's also gentle, it's also fragile? So what is it also almost metaphoric to us? We are fragile beings, we are also perishable, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a good uh, segue, segue for a um, uh, slide, Derek. So this piece, this, the, f the first thing that you sort of encounter is um, the wall. 
we'll get to the others later, but this wall, this large wall, it's a brick wall. It's a brick wall with, um, by your vision, nothing's holding it together except like these scraps of fabric, but they're not scraps of fabric. You can tell that it's clothing. Um, if you get closer, you can tell that it's more likely than not used clothing. It's not pristine. It's not in good shape necessarily always. Um, and then slide. Um, but before we get into maybe material parts of the wall or something like this is um, not the first time you've installed the piece before it was called wall. And now for this exhibition, as opposed to the smaller versions that it had been, we made it so that it's, you know, 30 feet by 15 feet, which is basically three times larger than it had been before. It's attached to the architecture, which it hadn't been before. It meets the ceiling, it meets the I-beams. And you also decided to change the name to fortified from wall. So maybe you can enter into that, yeah, that yeah. thought. So this wall, I was thinking, one thing about this show is I think everything that's in here doesn't belong here. Everything that's inside should be in an exterior space. So I was thinking about, of course, the piece started me thinking about walls. And of course, I came up with the idea after Trump and the border wall and all those ideas, and the politics of that, um, ideas about invisible borders. But I think I was thinking once, I, I was interested in this space of us getting rid of the walls that existed in the, in the gallery. And all of a sudden, what would it mean for this to now become a literal functioning wall in the space? Now it literally becomes architecture. But the architecture is different than usual architecture because literally this isn't, it's the mortar which would make this thing solid and permanent and, and, and confrontational and potentially problematic, even though <laughs> walls could be both shelters and protectors, is the fact that it's, 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 it's destabilized, it's unstable because it's just being held by the mortar is now clothing. So I wonder, thing, what is it? What, and I think about the Berlin Wall. Slide. I think about the Berlin Wall, and you know, all those years of families being separated, and that iconic image of the wall, that one section down of the wall. So you realize these these walls that are are seemingly permanent. These walls that seem to be imbued with more power than we think. It can be. It, they can be dismantled with our power. Like we have the power. So idea of having clothing, used clothing. This is all clothing. Clothing for my family members, clothing Slide. for the ICA. The idea that this clothing, like we, we are, we, we're the builders. The idea of fortify, like we're holding this together. And the idea of dismantling this, it's a slow process, but it'd be by brick by brick, you could take this down. I was also added, I want to kind of emphasize how this is, is just the, Slide. the instability of it it was important to have like those little bits of clothing and that's partly me i was thinking about an experience of um, being at the wailing wall in jerusalem and the idea like the, that those little spaces were this those spaces that negative space and those notes and they were almost like those represent those were the weight of the piece not that wall so what does it mean for these bits to be really the thing that's keeping this thing together I also love that many people worked on this piece, so it looks very different than when I installed it the first time. It was my hand, and now it became this crazy collage and this beautiful kind of painting. So I like the idea you had this almost larger-than-life, monumental, this monolithic singular thing, but then when you get close, you start to see the evidence of the one, of the individual, of the singular. This, this massive thing becomes, um, all of a sudden, it, is a hum it becomes there's a humility or there's a humbleness like, or there's a crushing thing of seeing, I think the next slide might be, a, or maybe we saw it already, that kids, that babies, um, the onesie being crushed. So then you're thinking about the, 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 the weight, the, the literal weight, but also the metaphoric um, weight of it. Okay, go forward a couple. So you kind of have this experience in the front and then you turn around, and I think this is the point that you don't, I think people didn't expect it, and I knew it was going to do this, but I didn't expect it to be so like gut wrenching. Where you turn the corner, and all of a sudden you just see this cascading like kind of wave or this like wall of 
his clothing, which of course is like a surrogate for the body. And you can't not think about migrants and the refugee crisis. I mean, I think all of that is kind of in it. And I wanted that to kind of be felt. So it's a pretty um, heavy when you turn out, but at the same time, it's also, there's something beautiful in seeing this mass, this seeing us together in some way. Um, but could we maybe also just venture a little thought about beauty? Uh, it's funny, I just was reading this, um, my friend Secret Sandstrom gave, gave me this book um, of essays, Erosion, um, and it, there's this great line that says, beauty is its own form of resistance, um, which I think is kind of, a, kind of amazing. What are you thinking about beauty? How am I thinking about beauty? Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, I wasn't ready for that question. <laughs> um, I think I'm always interested in formalism and beauty that comes from the corners. Um, I kind of feel like it's easy, perfection, the stereotype of perfection is always easily beautiful. It's more interesting to see a beauty that is unexpected, that sneaks up on you, whether it's person, sound, taste, space. Um, and so what I like about, I guess how I was thinking about beauty with your pieces in particular, particularly this, and a piece we'll get to in a, in two more pieces, um, the car is, um, there's, a, there's a first overpowering thing. The overpowering is like, whoa, and it's kind of spectacularly beautiful. And then it's kind of disgusting because you realize that there's a use, there's an oldness to it. Mm -hmm. You're too close to it, you can smell it, mm -hmm. and the smell is not necessarily awful, but it's not pleasant necessarily. It's not neutral, mm -hmm. as you're expecting of art. And so this beauty is, um, it's not as if you just go down a path of thinking just happy thoughts. Like you can't help but be a little bit darkened mm -hmm. by the corners of it. Oh yeah, I mean, I and, I li and I like that it sort of sticks with you. It sticks, and I like the fact that the details stick with you maybe more than the overall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I had a lot of painters who love this piece for obvious reasons, but then it starts to, it, the excess starts to speak also about I think about how there's a lot of clothes, all the clothing is used, but a lot of them you don't see the use because you start mm -hmm. thinking about fast fashion. So I'm thinking about the glut of that and then you start to think about globalism. And then you start to think about, well, we'll get to that with the other piece. So all of a sudden this thing that's kind of joyous and beautiful and you could, even like if you, and I see pieces of mine that I had beautiful memories and all of a sudden this excess speaks to kind of like the capitalist cultural Hopefully, maybe the pandemic is going to reveal enough to get us a little bit out of this. But I, you start to kind of feel the weight of how really messed up many things are in many ways. <laughs> you know? But then I was thinking about, I remember once uh, having a meeting with uh, Rob Storer. He's like, you do this thing where you seduce people in. And then it's not that you pull the rug from under them, but all of a sudden, then they start to see all of a sudden that the beauty and the seduction gets them in and then all of a sudden the layers start to kind of unveil and show themselves. Next slide. Next slide. It's not just that, but I think like the beauty also, like there's two things that happens like in this particular beauty. The beauty doesn't take me into a pure formalism. The beauty takes me back out to mm -hmm. the city, mm -hmm. to the street, to the, mm -hmm. to the outside. Um, mm -hmm. Think of it in your way. But also like the beauty here is like the, the wall looks really fragile when you see it at the side. Like you see that it's just a brick width, basically. You see, and the cloth is coming, cloth is coming down. So it actually, I feel like it emphasizes the maybe instability of the wall. The fact that this wall might not be as sturdy as we want to see a brick wall as being. And then it mm -hmm. sort of. So all of a sudden, like, what does that mean about these borders, these, these, yeah. These, these, these walls and these borders we put up, like we have more power than we think. <laughs> to yeah. Okay, next slide. So then another, okay, I guess I'll also back up to say three pieces in the show are reimaginings of older pieces or remakings of older pieces. And then three were new that came out of a year that you spent in Rome. And the time spent in Rome was obviously productive for 
not putting a cap, but maybe putting an emphasis on some of your thinking of monuments and memorials, but also thinking them maybe at an older, more historical nature than America tends to offer us as a platform for thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, to think also with a sort of travel and a emphasis on uh, ru ruin being a, a natural part of any memorial. Ruin, rather like, whether that's histories, whether that's civilizations coming and going, whether that's cities coming and going, or people, you know, coming and going. It's like it, all of these, all of these traffics. So this is another one of the pieces, moving the obelisk. Um, and so what you are looking at is a cardboard and dirt. An obelisk should be a singular piece of stone, should be an old singular piece of stone um, from Egypt. We have kind of an obelisk here. It's a multi-part obelisk that can fold in on its, not fold in on itself, but stack in on itself, made from dirt and um, to appear so more solid than it actually is. And then next slide. Next, okay. And so, and it's accompanied by a video, your first video. And the video, do you want to set up or do we just want to go to some stills first? Um, it was funny. I mean, there, there's some academy folks, there's some of the brilliant minds over there who helped me think about, think through obelisks in the history. I mean, I was, I was overwhelmed in, in Italy and I, and first I just in awe. And then you start to do the critical looking and thinking and then you say why are there's so many obelisks here <laughs> you know what i mean and then all of a sudden you're like oh then you find the history about them being used you know stolen and um pillaged during and used as triumph, um, triumphs of war and paraded through the triumphal um, processions but then all of a sudden so it's like oh yeah the roman empire and all of the kind of the, the fucked upness of that <laughs> but um but then you start looking back at the history and i had to, had to then really go back and look at the Egyptian history. So if I'm looking at, you know, black civilization, the complications with that, because if we were, if we were kings and queens, we had slaves, so all of a sudden things, histories were, um, there's a simultaneity of kind of reconciling histories that I wanted to kind of be emboldened by, but others that I was kind of horrified by. And then I was thinking, well, what does it mean today? What's the relevance of an obelisk today? And I kept saying, do I even do something with an obelisk? I'm like, yes, they still, these things are still kind of statements of power. They kind of are still have this presence. And I, well, and almost like, every major museum wants an obelisk. Right. Yeah. And what does it mean that it's, you know, it, it represented power and privilege and class back in Egypt, and then it goes to the Roman Empire, and then it crosses the sea again. So I'm thinking about what is this desire for the, the empire, the control of their... So then I started thinking about, like... So I was thinking about that in, like, kind of that early capitalism. Um, even if we might not call it that. And then I, so I could not then also think about the slave trade. So I decided what would it mean for me to make this obelisk that was out of cardboard and, I, and dirt. And I was thinking about dirt as such an important material in archeological sites. And I'm thinking about dirt as a shape-shifting material. Dirt um, could dissipate in water, but it's also, it holds history, it holds fossil fuels, it holds memory, it holds all of that. So I said, what would it be for me to use shipping boxes, you know, recycled boxes, and and, and dirt, and then there's an absurdity to it. So it's like, it seems like the most efficient way to make an obelisk, but it also goes counter to how they were made traditionally, but also at the same time, it's as spectacularly ridiculous and, and absurd. But what is it, but, but that's countered with, it's my obelisk, and I'm a black woman who made this thing, and I made, this is my monument, so now I become the monument. So it's kind of a complicated, so I was trying to weave these different histories and narratives in this video. And I guess we could show there are a couple. I well, we have a couple. I'm gonna. I'm, well, I'm gonna interrupt just a second to say like the video is available on the ICA website, so people who want to watch the video can visit the exhibition page at their own leisure and watch. It's a 12-minute video um, with a voiceover, and the voice. So the video, in the video, what we see is. Um, I guess it's interesting, like at first you thought about casting an obelisk, you wanted to make an obelisk. And so what we're actually looking at is your initial uh, prototype to try to figure out how to cast or what size to make the obelisk, how to make it look. 
and then that ended up being the actual obelisk. So the video starts at your studio in Rome, and we see the obelisk standing, we see it taken apart, we see it shipped, and then we see it reconstituting the Philadelphia. And I will just to, in case people can't read, I will read, we've got the subtitles, you know, on the screen grab. So it's, this particular one has the voiceover. The Egyptians were the original recyclers. Kings in their hubris demanded that previous signatures of power be chiseled away, removed. Uh, then we can advance. And we get um, obelisk mined near the banks of the Nile, traveled down river to locations where they stood for millennia. Then they crossed the Mediterranean to the shores of Roman emperors as, as trophies of war. Oh, Darren screams. Let's see, I'm gonna. Then years later, special ships would be outfitted to carry obelisks across the Atlantic to the New World. But not before the onslaught of European ships, steered again by greed and conquest, outfitted to carry millions. Water is an element which remembers the dead. Next slide. Then there are two Egypts for us. Which of the two Africas is an African American? An African Caribbean? Which Africa is ours? In ancient Egypt, there was the original Philadelphia, which in Greek means brotherly love. It is um, widely displaced, a stranger in a strange land. Indeed, the past is only past because there is a present. The past, or more accurately, pastness, is a position. So maybe here, like instead of talking specifically about this piece, could we talk about um, presentness and pastness? Uh, because I think a lot of your monuments and memorials that you've built in the last couple of years, few of them are permanent. A couple are, but few of them have been permanent. And it doesn't seem that you've been worried about their permanence, that they've been built to be temporary. So maybe you could, yeah, how you think that through. For stars, I was thinking about how the permanent monuments are not serving. And maybe the fact that they are, they, they are in the materials that are seemingly permanent doesn't allow a space for us to imagine their function. I was wondering if there's different materials will allow you to position yourself in it. If it's temporary and it's shifting, or if it's a material like I'm thinking about like my monument lab piece with the mirrored monument, the monument never was sitting still, was always shifting, which made you have to reimagine it or reinsert yourself in a new way. I was thinking sometimes I think about like if something is temporary, it could actually be more indelibly imprinted on you than something that's permanent. Something that's um, a permanent material in its there's a resignation in it, so then there's nowhere to go. And I think about history in that way. I was thinking about, I want to read the quote that, that we used from this last bit. Um, it's from this um, Haitian anthropologist, um, Michel Rolf, um, I forgot how to pronounce it, uh, Trullo. And the whole quote is, um, um, but the past does not exist independently from the present. Indeed, the past is only past because there is a present. Just as I can point to something over there only because I'm here, but nothing is inherently over there or here. In that sense, the past has no content. The past, or more accurately, pastness of position. And he was speaking about, he did a lot of writing about the silencing of history or the silencing of the archive. And he did a lot of talking about like history as fiction. He's thinking about history as fiction because historians are selecting what's history is becoming the status quo, that what's, what history makes into the canon. Mm -hmm. So in a way, because it's, it's fiction, that only it's some, is, some, of the, some of the history is silent. Some of the experiences, some of the, the facts are, don't make it. So I was thinking, oh wait, I want to go back to what you're saying about permanence. So the fact that I'm thinking that history is always being rewritten, history is never complete, the more people having as, access to the history that's been hidden, more people have access to the more more diversity in terms of who is going to be the historians and also speak about what history gets told. So I keep thinking about like, so if it's, a, if, it's um, if history is constantly shifting in a way, wouldn't that make sense for monuments and its materiality to not be material that 
stays the same. And yes, stone can get debris that can leave, that could taint it and patina it. But what does it mean for us to have to reconcile with this thing that isn't, it's actually acting the way we are, like it's relying on context, which is creating the content and the meaning, or what's happening politically or what's happening culturally will impact it. If it has a physical being uh -huh. that's, that's malleable, that's possible, but I also don't think it has to be a material that's, what does it mean to make sure the object and what's the conversations that are happening around and the gathering that's happening around it is shifting and happening and changing and the gathering is doing something. I don't know if I answered that. I'm kind of meandered a little too much maybe. <laughs> No, it's it's good, and it makes me think. I mean, there's a there's another artist that I worked with um, who said once that the past is a better marker of the future than the present. In part because, like, the stories we tell about the past or what we are willing to accept about the past is going to make actually going to make the path forward. Mm -hmm. It's going to make us whether or not we're happy with our path or whether or not we want to change our path. And so, like, if we are not willing to identify certain aspects of our past. We're just going to go on a very easy path mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or maybe like a, a less conflicted path or we're not going to change the things that we maybe should be changing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to remind people right now that if you have questions, please type them into the chat because as opposed to doing a live Q&A, we will be sort of compiling questions. And then, so if you have curiosities for Karen or I, probably more likely Karen because she's more interesting. Hardly. Um, Are we going to have to go faster if you wanted to be open up okay. a Q and A like around seven twenty? Yeah, we might have to. Well, it depends on you. <laughs> you. I have a question for you. Okay, ask me a question. Well, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. I have two. Well, I have many questions, but the two I was thinking about the most. Um, I was thinking about. I read about your interest in ghosts. Yes. And I was thinking about the role of the specter and the role of like trace. I'm also thinking about the pandemic too, but about trace and the periphery or the spectral quality of objects. or like the space between objects in terms of like when you're curating or even I know you're a musician. So I'm thinking like, what is like, when I think about ghosts and specter and space and absence and the invisible, but the absence is present. I'm wondering if there's anything you think about in terms of when you're curating because i also think about sometimes with your shows there's a lot of um we'll get to this later i feel so my work feel can feel very singular and my friend helen o'leary calls it like iconic looking well i find a lot of your shows have this improvisation there's fragmentary elements so things that kind of could do this thing going on so i'm just wondering about that and your interest in I'll answer that. First, I'll say slide, just so we get maybe like a gallery view uh, going. Or, yeah, let's go here. Um, okay, yeah, like I do, oh dear. Okay, I don't want to monopolize this, but ghosts are important to me. I don't know if I believe in ghosts in terms of, you know, like, woo, you know, like uh, opening and closing doors, things like that, but I think you know, what are the traces of history if not ghosts? So we could think of, there is a long shadow cast by slavery. There's a long shadow cast by things like the Holocaust. There's a long shadow cast by policies of exclusion. And whether or not those policies are still in place, they're not exactly absent as long as there's some person or some object or some institution that still has that life in it. And so how you deal with those ghosts tells a lot about how comfortable you are in the space around. Um, and I guess in my own thinking, I'd always thought of ghosts as literal ghosts, literal hauntings, literal voice. You know, I've been interested in people who think they can record the voices of the dead, ghost hunters. I've always had a fascination with that kind of thing. Um, and I think that nicely segues into my interest in music and the fact that once it's over, you have to remember it. There's nothing to look at, particularly if it's a concert. You have to like, wait, did that happen first or did that happen second? You have to start retelling it to yourself. And in that retelling, maybe you get it right, maybe you don't. 
in the ghosts or that added narrative. And on top of that, there's a sociologist, um, Avery Gordon, who wrote a book called Ghostly Matters. And she tried to actually literalize ghosts sociologically, say one of her clearest examples was the, the disappeared in Argentina. They're not dead. We don't know they're dead. They're no longer here. They were politically inconvenient. And that politics was made not just inconvenient, but disappeared. They are still present. They are present as a, they have, you know, wives, husbands, children, relatives, and those bodies have never been found. They are haunting the political landscape. And like, they are in the, spheres they are in the bookshops they are in the stores so that book really transformed me into thinking like no like i don't know how you could in that way i don't know how you could not believe in ghosts and i'm very very i love artwork that has ghost stories to it i guess you could say um it's i think of my if there's any through line to the shows that i do it's I, I want there to be ghosts. Nice. And there's always something, I always leave something out of a show. Um, and that might just be for myself to keep a different energy for the next one or keep something forward for the next one. But yeah. What? And I, yeah, wait, I just and have I, another question that I want to ask. Okay. I just discovered that you have a blog <laughs> called Anthony Elms Absorb. And I sense it could be related to your curatorial approach and your ways of, obviously, the ways of experiencing the world. But I was thinking about, the, like, the word absorbs is so significant. And I was thinking if you could talk about that, the blog, or something in terms of its relationship to your making, your making art, your, your, your making music, and your making exhibitions. Okay, first of all, like the blog, I never intended to be interesting to anybody else, <laughs> but you some people followers. are interested. You have followers. I do, but I mean, for me, it was more about my way of thinking. And okay, okay, we'll get it to me, but to tie this, I'll try to tie it quickly. The blog started when I kept losing notebooks. I had always kept notebooks of every show I saw, every book I read, every record I listened to, and after I kept losing them on trips, losing them, you know, th through accidents, and I was upset about it, a friend said, why don't you just start a blog? Then you're never going to lose it. I was like, you're a genius. And you're more internet savvy than me. Um, and for me, why those lists are important is I have an inability to build walls. So when I think about an artist that I like, I'm like, oh, I saw their show the same time that I was reading that book. That book had that thought I liked. Mm -hmm. That thought was on the right-hand page in the last third of the book when I'm bad with names. So if I go to this blog, I can go February. I can look at the date that I saw a show. I can look at what I was reading in that week. I'm like, that's the book. And then I suddenly can capture it. So it's actually like a it's my associative database. And I think of it absorbing because I think of it, it's like, it's in here. I've taken it in. It's, it's not necessarily things I support. It's not necessarily things I like. That's the funny thing, right? Like, it's not like a listening guide or a reading guide. Like, I read some garbage and I listen to a lot of shit and I will listen to that shit 30 times to go, is that record really bad? And go, no, right, it is really bad, you know. Uh, Wow. And so it's a, it's not necessarily a, you should be paying attention to this because like this is stuff with good thoughts. It's, it is literally like an internal. But it was interesting to me, when, once I discovered it, it made me think of like my first studio visit with you in 2013, where I know you didn't like the work or you didn't like most of it, but it was still a three and a half hour studio visit <laughs> and you were absorbing. And I could tell there was something because there was, quiet moments and I was like okay I think this is just what he does like so that it felt so there was something about that so when I saw that blog I'm like that's who I experienced in 2013. Okay I'm going to respond to that in two ways a 
I don't think you liked the work that I saw in your studio in 2013, in part because I saw that same piece transformed at least six times at different visits. And, it's, and I've never seen it shown publicly. So um, I'm not the only one in the room who is having problems with that piece. Secondly, I do think um, if you only approach the world by things that you like, the world is only open to things that you've experienced or that you've run into. And so liking, me liking work is probably like the last step of actually engaging with work. The first steps are, what's the logic of this? What's that person's interest? What's that person's world? Where is that person coming from? Because all of that might be more important than where I was yesterday and where I was the day before. And the world is more fascinating by people who are coming from different traditions, different thoughts, different mindsets, different ages, identities, all those things, right? And so if I walk into a room and I like it immediately, chances are I've already seen something like this and already liked something like this. Um, and it behooves all of us to take our time to actually think about like what's making me uncomfortable here. Is that discomfort negative or is that discomfort positive? Mm -hmm. Particularly with art where you have the, art's not really gonna threaten you. So you have a moment of pause. I think we're all having that now with uh, okay. being but, locked down. But no, we're definitely having that right now. Mm -hmm. So maybe, um, I love the fact that you included one source material in your images that you gave us. So let's go back one slide. So this. This photo is from- Let's not just talk about this photo, but let's also talk about you and source material. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it's, I, I rely on source material, rely on research, I rely on researching histories. I rely on like, what is there, what's presumed and what's not there. I think because my background is not art, I wasn't grounded in art backgrounds. So I really feel so for me to look at things and then say, what is this? What's its history? What is its relevance in this place, location? And understand its usefulness of what it is there, how it functions. Then that could be the trigger for me to think of what to look at, what to research, what to question, or the whole what ifs. If I see something that's known, where's the what, what's the what if of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, or then, or then you start to connect the dots. This isn't a car selling, you know, shoes on, used shoes on top of this car, but that's the same like in Trinidad where you'll see stuff being sold in the street and like everything is repurposed. Objects and things have new, multiple functions. Things don't, don't have only one. There's always a way to like, a chair could be a table, it could be your coffee table, it could be like your ladder, you know what I mean? Like the repurposing and the malleability of things. I think we're all finding that too in the pandemic where, okay, you can't get all the things you need, so this could stand in for this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this was a photograph I had in my studio for you know, like eight years before I could figure out what to do with it. You know, it took a while. It took like an NPR program <laughs> to do with it. Damn NPR. <laughs> I guess it's gotta come to the rescue at some point. You know? Oh, okay. So what, what was the rescue? What was the NPR rescue? Well, actually it was two things. Um, it was actually around the time was uh, that image of that Syrian boy washed up on the shore with the, the shoe um, mm -hmm. to the side. Um, and I was talking to a friend about this, the piece and she's like, you know, whenever you see shoes off, it's often about there's also uh, there's a violence with it or a genocide or there's something about it that's, that's um like urgently um an urgent situation often um but then it was hurricane harvey had happened and there was this one nonprofit that instead of giving donating goods they were giving people debit cards and you know this woman was saying you know people keep sending us bottle, bottles of water and, and i just need money to fix my roof so that made me think of so I'm thinking about that locally happening in houston but then I'm thinking about across the globe, you know, our Western patronage to the, to the developing world, in quotes, um, and this kind of complicated relationship we have with like charity, but then we think about the charities as a result of post-colonial 
policies and imperialism. So it's a weird relationship to it. So, so I'm going from thinking of Houston and a hurricane there, but also thinking about the developing world and where, so you have these shoes that we, we give or we give to like the Salvation Army, but if no one buys them here, then they get sent off as export shoes. So I made, so I decided, oh my God, I saw the car cover, I heard that program and I thought I'm gonna fill a car cover with export shoes. The shoes that are destined, you know, for the, the, the third world. So, and then I'm thinking it would bring up ideas Slide. of of access and privilege. You could go to the next Slide. one. Access, privilege. Who has to rely on public transportation? Who who can I? I think about even right now, like who has to go to work? Some train lines Slide. in New York are packed up with people. You know, there's no there's no quarantine for them. So I was thinking of all those ideas. You know you know, local to across the globe and what would it mean to kind of put these together? And it just seemed to make sense. And, you know, so it's a car cover, a new one, and then it's holding. And I kind of like that this piece is, is in the same show with the wall because there's a different speed to it. I mean, there's a tension in this where you take off the car cover and there's like the cascade of the, the shoes fall. There's a different sort of tension. Well, with the wall, it's literally a, like a methodical, like brick by brick of taking down a system or taking it down. Um, and I would like to just give an anecdote for those, because sometimes, you know, it's, it's nice to have anecdotes from the behind the scenes. Um, oh, yeah. This is one of the weirder and harder pieces. <laughs> and uh, before my, my privileged life as a curator, I, I spent a good 12 years, 10 years, 12 years? I should know this. Eh, whatever. A long, long time as a, as a preparator. And so I'm used to sweating for other people's artwork. But I had my hands in this one and my hands got really dirty. My clothes got really dirty. And I got sweaty because until you've actually tried to physically hold the shape of a car a by a bunch shoes. of loose, dirty shoes that are just held together by, a, by an elastic band, you, you haven't experienced life, actually. Um, I was so glad that the wall was taking so long to be built. I'm like, you guys got that? <laughs> I just don't want to have to make that stinky piece. But that's, a, I love this piece too, because you kind of smell it. In a smaller space, you smell, smell it more intensely than you do yeah. here. You get up there and, and it's, it's, it's un, unmistakably um, felt the absence. There's such a strange thing with the show where it's so filled, but it's filled with absence, you know, it's, I mean, could we also talk about maybe um, you're kind of a, you're a weird maker. You're a sort of, I mean, you're, on one level, you're a traditional sculptor. These are very defined forms. These are very defined shapes, very known shapes, but it's not pop. I mean, you're dealing with car, wall, obelisk, carousel, but these aren't, I would never think of these as pop, but I would think of them as very defined forms and very definite forms. Um, just think about like how you approach sculpture or how you promote approach form generally. Huh. I think I, I still think it goes back to n not being a child thinking about made up fantastical worlds. It was like literally like a lot of these things started with memories and history and what would it mean? Okay, I have a carousel. We know how that functions, but when you're a traditional carousel. It's an amusement park with tons of sounds and tons. It's like you're they're there to bombard your senses to the point where you lose yourself. So I was like, okay, I like that experience, but can I do that? Can that happen without with all uh, without the loud music and the bells and the, the chairs, the horses going up and down? What would it mean for me to make something that kind of lets me lose myself, but then it's stripped down? So now I so then I took something that was familiar and just said, okay, now okay. It's only going to be one chair, so it's a solitary, it's a ride just for me. Okay, instead of it going counterclockwise, it's going to go clockwise. So now it's going forward, so all of a sudden this familiar thing's become less so. Also now, take five minutes to make, makes one, makes, takes, you know, five minutes to make one, one. Um, Maybe one show the video. Around. But what I love about this piece is that it changed so much in this space. Its role here, in terms of being a monument and a memorial, it totally shifted. And yes, at the opening, there were tons of kids playing on and they were loving it and people, and there was very joyous in a lot of ways. But there was a slowness to this. It was so slow, but not still. I think if it was still, 
you kind of just got caught up in your own head again. But mm -hmm. the fact that you're slowly moving around, you, the, you became a witness. This was like, you were the witness while you were under here. And it was a strange thing about the covering. I remember Donna Nelson saying, she's like, I felt like I was on an island. I felt isolated and vulnerable, but I also felt protected. But it was a strange thing that you were the witness of the kind of the, some atrocities kind of around or that you can imagine. It was a strange, and even at the opening when there were a lot of people, it, you, it was a strange thing to be under there. It's like you were, you were an outsider looking in, and you felt this invisible wall and border between the objects. But, that, but at the same time, you're catching them all in your periphery. We will get to a photo in a moment. We don't have video from with, from under it, but we have a couple of photos taken from within it. But before we get there, yeah. it's also interesting to note as we watch how it progresses now. I mean, your head doesn't move 360 degrees. So if you actually sit in the chair and you spend time in the piece and can spend time in the piece, what's re also remarkable when it's inside is there's this interminable three minute section where you're just staring at a blank white wall waiting for any sort of incident waiting. I mean, there might be another person to look at, but if you don't know that person, you're not going to stare them in the eyes. You're not going to address them for that three, three full three minutes. And it's like, it's not as it's yes, it's fun. Yes. It's enjoyable, but it's not the, uh, it's not the most in, enjoyable. It could be uncomfortable. And it's it can be uncomfortable. Yeah. It, and it is kind of vulnerable. It's like, if you actually sit with it, you're like, sort of like, Oh, I'm I'm gonna sit this through. I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna let someone approach me or not approach me, or ignore me or not ignore me, or the view be interesting. The view be, and it's it's a very um strange. As someone who loves being an individual in crowds, it's I never feel as vulnerable weirdly as I did sitting in that chair. Um, maybe you could go forward to show another shot move the slide forward. So, I mean, Anita. maybe this gives you a, a slight view of like, when you're in the space also, it's noticeably darker. You're aware of the fact that it might look great from the outside, but on the inside, you, you know that it's a darker space. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very different exchange. It's, um, if you embrace all the things it's doing, it's a, it's a tough, it's tough in a lot of ways because you're stuck. It's like the slowness makes you see, <laughs> like yeah. you're perceptive of everything and that macro micro feeling of it, you're, you're very much aware of. And you're aware of distance in a really strange way, like how either close or distant you are from, from people, from the other pieces, from, yeah, and well, maybe, one it, of the, it may, it, could you talk about the title at all? Oh, I'll talk about it in a second, but I remember the week, we all had to go into lockdown. There was someone on Instagram who said, I wish I could sit on that carousel again because it's, it, it's, it's, it, the experience on it was ex is exactly how I'm feeling. This anxiety, this ambivalence, but the protection. And, and I was like, well, that's like the best compliment. I mean, it's also horrible because I mean, it was a really, like, a really terrible time where kind of all contending with you know but i was like oh but that's you know what did david foster wall say artist to what is it to afflict the make the afflict the well you know what's that famous thing the comfortable, well, afflict the comfortable comfort, comfort yeah. the afflicted yeah, yeah. And i'm yeah. like yeah that's so the title it's not over till it's over i feel so i would change the title uh because <laughs> um now but now it's it, it works to like it doesn't end you know, and this piece, I did make it after a very bad breakup. <laughs> it, was kind of like, it was like my breakup piece. So I think if I had to, in the context of the show, I would have changed it to the witness, the witness, the wit Ooh. witness or something. You know what I mean? Because I feel like that's its, its role. That it totally was a new role in the show. You know, hmm. it's, so, yeah. Um, next slide. We're almost done, folks. I know. So before we get to, before we get to questions, we won't play this piece, but I kind of, part because it's internet and you know people's times and 
covering people or not, but there's a sound piece. Also one of your, I guess your third sound piece, second, third. Um, And it's church bells. It's church bells that sound the sound of church bells as if you're in a space. So they're coming from different directions and they are not on the hour, not on the half hour, but every 20 minutes. And this image is a location shot. So maybe you could talk about why the bells or how, how the bells are. So this is a church in the south of Italy, Italy in Puglia. And I thought of bells, well, partly in Italy, you, you, you hear bells all the time. But I was also thinking about Morocco, where you're hearing the call to prayer and how you're, it's ha- same thing happened in Italy, where you hear it and you're in your mother church, like this is the mother church of Giuliano de Lecce. But then you can hear the next town over. But I was thinking about how church, this, to me, there is, it started with the carnation, which to me personally ties me to a church because I, ha- I had that experience of the carnation on Mother's Day. So I, I didn't want to shy away from religion or spirituality, but the idea that the bells comes from a church is recognizable. But I also think about how bells were used at times of war as a call to, a call to come together, a call to be get ready, a call to beware. So I was thinking, what would it mean to have this bell, these bells come on intermittently? It's only 30 seconds long in this space. So it could be just a wake up to like, to pay attention or to be aware of the present moment, but also to think about time and how time is doing a strain. Time and how it exists in this, in the work is disparate. You have like a timeless piece like the obelisk, but it's also cardboard made in a contemporary way, but it also could dissipate the quickest to dissipate. So I wanted to think about time and the different ways time's with fun- time is functioning, the, the carousel that's just going way too slow, like it's making you see too much. So I thought it'd be a nice way to kind of just a, almost like a puncturing, like it marking the space in a way and the time. And I like the idea of also having a piece that some people would miss, you know, like if you're in the sh- gallery for 15 minutes or maybe you're upstairs at Michelle Lopez's show and you're hearing her flag sound piece and all of a sudden you hear a bell is that from outside like her bell her flag was outside so i kind of liked how it was this piece that just kind of existed that you may not or may experience yeah okay so i'm about to try to address some questions that we've gotten from i I can't quite call this an audience even though i know i should but you know it doesn't feel like a bunch of rectangles is exactly an audience um but before i do that uh do you have a Another question for me before I open it to the floor, Karen? Um, we kind of talked about them all. Yeah, we're good. Mm-hmm. I guess, maybe was there anything, um, was anything surprising for you with the show? Well, I mean, I, I can't answer that in a- Okay, I mean, move on. Well, no, I, I can't answer it because like, I only do shows where something's going to be surprising for me. I I feel like if I have two rules for shows and one of them is like, if I'm not surprised, I'm not doing it. Right. Or if I don't have an opportunity to be surprised, I'm not doing it. So that's one of my cardinal rules. Um, So yes, definitely surprised. Um, And I think that's, that's my privilege right now of choosing the shows I get to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I get to sort of, think through like what's actually a problem that I want to try to learn more about or think more about. Um, And you know, you're the first large scale sculptor that I've worked with. So even on a formal level, it's like, that's a whole different uh, conversation and question. 3000 bricks, baby. (laughs) I know. Like I've I've never had, I've actually never had a show where we had no artwork shipped to the museum. We only had material. And all the materials had to be turned into the art. That's, totally. that's, a, wow. that's, a new, that's a new one for me. Nice. So I'm going to try to read these questions. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Okay, here's a good one I can remember to read. Um, can you speak more about the community element of your work? And that's for Karen. And then for me, it's like, and my curatorial practice. And then for you, the addition of like, for that community work, how does that, um, how is it in you create and how you hope it to be received? Um, good question. I, I mean, um, 
community, I think about, I think about community in different ways. I mean, I start my semester with my students saying, this is a community and we have to care and respect each other and be there for each other because this is the community we have and hopefully this will kind of build and you're creating other communities. So I feel so community is a thing I think of in terms of my pedagogy and also the artwork. It's obvious in terms of maybe the public work where to me it was it's really, I mean, like the piece I did in Vernon Park in Philadelphia, it's in my neighborhood. So when I thought about community, I had to think about, well, how do I make a work that matters? What, what can I presume and be presumptuous and audacious enough to think that, my, that could be useful? So when I think about community, it's like, what can I do that could kind of, that we could not necessarily rally around, but what can I do that could kind of make us um, consider things we hadn't considered, look at our, our community and think about like what we, what we took for granted or what we assumed or what we overlooked. When I thought about community in terms of the ICA, I felt as though I was embraced by a community who had to kind of make this tedious, laborious work with me. And I feel like we became a community there. So I'm not sure the question in terms of what you mean by community, um, in terms of making the work or like, but I am always thinking, like when I first made a bunch of playgrounds works, I was thinking about, my nephews who were young at the time and I knew they were going to have to come to museums and see these shows. How do I make, make work that they can engage, but also the art world can engage. So I guess I'm thinking, I, I, I think when I guess when, also when I think about community, I think about publics, like they're different publics. Mm. Um, and they're different publics that sometimes intersect, sometimes they don't, but they're, they're, um, they kind of matter in different ways. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm going to tag team on that in two ways. The first way is to be, to be generous and to answer the person's question to me and to say like, I tend to think of community as several different ways. I think of myself as a curator. My job, like curators don't need to exist. Art, art gets made, artists make art, curators are kind of bureaucrats. Art would be fine without us. So if we have a role, our role is, that, is to be mediators. Like artists can be as private as they want and as, um, into their work or as public as they want, but I have no choice to be public and to think of a public. And so my role is not necessarily to do great shows or to do bad shows or to do path-breaking shows. My inherent job as a curator is to make artwork public and to make whatever artist it is, whatever idea I've chosen or wh whatever group I'm working with to figure out how to make that public so that mm -hmm. someone else might be able to see in it what I see, or to see the opportunity, to see the chance, to see the ideas. And so my, my role is inherently about, you know, sort of translating from, oh, you can choose to talk, you can choose to not give a talk, but I have to talk, and I have to sort of be a bridge into this world mm -hmm. that I value. And furthermore, I, I also think in terms of how I've always thought about community, it comes from my past of spending it in basements for noise music and punk shows and then warehouses for rave shows it's like not everybody liked that music not everybody wanted to hear that music but everybody was welcome and so my job as a curator is to try to make everybody welcome nice. you can walk away hating it but i've tried to make it i've tried to make it available for you and tried to take away any sort of step for you feeling welcome in the space or welcome with the work Yes. And if it's not a welcome that you want, wait six weeks. It'll be something different. Um, and if it is a welcome that you want, then come back because it will likely connect to something in the future. And then it's a nice segue to another question we got, which was just for Karen. The most powerful ghosts are one's own or those of one's people. When you were talking about monuments and memorials, I was thinking about family, and I know yours is important to you. How has family informed your pieces? Oh, wow. I feel so early on, um, I felt like I kept making twin work. <laughs> I don't know if my <laughs> twin's still on. And I was like, I remember giving this talk, and someone said, and I, and I was like, oh my God, I'm a twin. <laughs> so I realized I do think about- You should back up and like, you have a twin. You literally yeah, have a, I literally a twin. Have a twin. Yes. yes. Go twin. Um, <laughs> So I, 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 think, I think it goes back to like the non-art background. 
like I wanted to, I, I'm thinking I want to make work that my fam, my parents could be get excited about. I know that maybe there's some theory that's in there too that they don't necessarily need to know, but how do, it's critical. I felt like it was critical for me to make work that people could access. So I guess for me, I guess the, in terms of family, yeah, I want my family to, un, to, to I, I can't make work, if, if it has, I mean, my mom, every time she reads something, she's like, wow, you sound so smart. But she didn't need that, you know, she kind of felt it, 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 it happened. And to me, it's important for like my people and by extension, you know, the rest, the publics, to, to, to be able to access something that kind of open up something, actually add some sort of slit, some sort of way of seeing in that maybe didn't seem plausible or possible, but now you realize there it is. Yeah. I'm not a conceptual artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's very few, I mean, oh my God, don't get me started on conceptual art. Um, there's like, it's a generational thing and like there's only like six of them to begin with and it, nobody else that calls themselves conceptual is. Um, there's still so many okay. that do though. <laughs> they say they are, but they're not. They're, 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 yeah. We'll get into that later, privately. Um, okay, another question. Uh, Sonia has asked, can you share your thoughts regarding monuments made for interior versus exterior spaces and how that might frame a uh, gathering as a component of the work? Yeah, so I was thinking about, you know, I, the early work I made, I think I was always thinking, I was thinking about identity and position and history and access. And I think I always approached those works when I even if it was using, you know, coffee tables or whatever. And then when I started switching to the public work, it was obvious what my responsibility was. It was obvious because of the times we're living in. But then all of a sudden I was like, why can't I, why am I reserving these public works, like kind of like the urgency that's asked for in the public or like the considerations in the public where on some level you have to be explicit because you go out, when people see in public art or monuments, it, it, I feel like you have to make work that, not necessarily get their attention, but the world is already so amazing. They, doesn't, they don't need us. So I'm thinking, but, so I'm making those works. I started making works I thought really worked well in terms of researching complex histories and how to reveal these things without resolving it, but revealing it. But then I thought to myself, why can't museums or art spaces be the site for memorials? What would it mean for those to be a site, a site for gathering, a site for reckoning, a site for commemoration, a site for holding each other's pain? I was thinking about this piece one of my grad students a couple of years ago did, Kara Springer, and it was one of the best pieces. She decided to fill the wall between her space and the next student's thesis show and filled it with canned goods. And the idea is, was art institutions, these cultural spaces should be the space people go to in times of crisis. Like what would it mean for the museum to be that? So I'm thinking like, and even though they might not, people may not necessarily quickly read them as monuments, I think the, the carnation is an obvious one. What does it mean for, uh, for these spaces to hold these histories that are, haven't been reconciled and that are conflicting and complicated? And even though it's private, it's still public and there are various publics that are experiencing it. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm always, for me, the, the most important thing when I start, like when I start the work, I go to like, if, there's, if it's at a museum, I wanna know what the, the guards think. Because they're the ones, first of all, they, yeah. have, they have the most knowledge, they have the experience, they're often artists, but they have the time and the attention, the job is to, for, to, be, uh, to be attentive. And that could be to the people, but to, to the works that are there, to what's happening between the works. So I'm always thinking about like, what do, what is, what do, what do they think about it? And that kind of give me an idea of like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> if they're okay with it, it's good. Okay, like we got 15 minutes, so I'm gonna to try to get through a couple of things, but um, in that thought, I think that thought segues into like one, one thought that I think we should address before maybe getting to the last two questions that we had. Hopefully we can get it all in 15 minutes. Um, this show has six pieces, and two of the pieces 
are barely there. One is sound, so it doesn't take up you know any physical space, and one was carnations, so you know it only took up the space of a lapel. Right. So actually, the space is only really filled with four pieces, which makes it extremely sparse for a show mm -hmm. that that I've done personally. Um, but now we're dealing with, I mean, this might be different. It's going to be different depending on your geographical you know, natures, but like Philadelphia being someone who lives center city is, it's busier than I expected to be, but it's also outrageously sparse. And I can't believe how quiet the streets are. And the sounds that I do hear tend to be more general than not disturbing. Sirens, helicopters going to the hospital, that kind of thing. So maybe you could talk about like how much presence there is in the show or how much presence there is in like your interest as a maker versus balancing that with the absence that's a part of so many of the ideas that you're starting your notion of presence with. Yeah, I think I've, I, I think I've always thought about that relation between invisibility and visibility, partly as a black person, partly as an immigrant. But in that, in the, even like the billboard project I did when I took photographs of what was behind me, I was like, in the invisibility, that spotlight and invisibility then reveals, right? But I'm thinking mm -hmm. about that, but I'm thinking about, wait, what were you saying? Wait, go back. <laughs> I, got, I got lost for a second. I probably did too. Um, I guess I was thinking of like, you know, balancing absence and presence okay. because there's, there's yeah, a yeah. huge presence in the show, but the show is actually very empty. But the show is you know. Yeah. And a lot of I your mean, ideas level, come from absence and a lot of yeah. you know. I, I guess I, on one level I like that the absence also functions just just physically because then when we are there we're feeling we're com I hate that I'm not even speaking in terms of like installation art and us completing the work, but the bodies that are there fill in that what what was not there. That like, like they're filling that space. So for me, that's kind of like, so the, the, the invisible of the absence is now being filled in by the people there. But there's something about like the invisibility, in that invisibility, you're forced to see. <laughs> if there's clarity, there's a revealing, there's an unveiling. Or if I think about invisibility, I could think about like the minute micro, which you may miss, or the periphery. So it's not just about invisibility, but the periphery, but then what happens when that thing on the periphery, be it bell hooks talking about the margins where black folks are the radical spaces of love and creation that happen at the margins. What happens when all of a sudden that periphery, you look at it and that becomes the world, that becomes the space, that target, that becomes the possibility. So for me, I guess I'm thinking about invisibility. And when we think it's invisible, it's never, it's not visible. <laughs> It's just what we're choosing, <laughs> what we're choosing to spotlight, what we're choosing to see. So I'm kind of playing, I'm thinking about, it just seems like a complicated, that's, that seems, and that to me relates to like borders which are known and physical, but then if so, uh, we could speak just as much about the invisible borders that are felt more readily than the, the, board, the, the supposed yeah. borders. You know, we have the, the border wall, but people get through. We have walls you feel and can find in, in like right now, the confine, you're walking outside and there's no one, you, you feel the border of the six feet. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking mm -hmm. about those different, those different things, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the questions. Gonna try to do, 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 do. Um, Okay, we have another one. Can you talk about, oh, this is a good segue. Can you talk about optimism and pessimism in your work? I notice an abundance, and they have like sort of an aside, I notice an abundance of optimistic aspirational work on social media, particularly during stay at home. Um, there is a melancholy component to much of the work discussed here. I guess a pessimistic optimistic reading is on the viewer primarily, but does it factor into what you decide to make or how you decide to complete the work? Um, I'll first say like one thing, even in that initial studio visit, whether you thought I liked the work or didn't like the work at all, the first thing that did strike me is like, I'm a sucker for good melancholy. And like, there was melancholy 
there was melancholy present. Um, so I do think that's a, that has been a present part of your work. Mm -hmm. Even when it gets playful, it's, it's a playful that has a, it's playful with a semicolon rather mm -hmm. than playful with a period. I, th I was thinking, is America the only place where melancholy isn't a thing that's celebrated? Or what that space of melancholy and, and nostalgia could allow? Like it isn't Nat King Cole. <laughs> you know, I feel like in, in like, I was thinking about like some of my early work, it was very easy for my work to be shown in, in Mexico and Latin America and Trinidad, places that, in Sweden, and places that kind of, there's an acknowledgement of presentness and aliveness has to contain all of that. I mean, we have a, a, our, our kind of infancy of being American, of, of this country, of wanting everything to still, like, I'm still worried about after the pandemic and the amnesia. You know what I mean? There is something that's mm -hmm. okay with um, the deep looking that will expose the cracks, it'll, ex it'll expose where we've fallen. But how can we not know that from the fall you come up? I mean, I'm then I start to think like, how do we as black folks, how do I like, are you kidding me? Three months later, we realize a black woman was murdered. <laughs> I mean, how can I not feel intense pain or have that, that residue or that trace of the complexity and the sadness and the disappointment that humans do to each other every day but we turn to the flip side and talk about right now the tenderness and love that is just like exuding out of people at the same time that horrific things are happening at the same time so what does it mean to use like melancholy i don't think of melancholy as a place where you stay it's um it's almost um you it, it's not concrete or grounded it's almost like you it, it's flee fleeting or it's not it doesn't stay somehow there's room for it to vacillate and move so it doesn't stay stuck or something okay. so it can function in different ways i don't know but i'm okay with melancholy oh i love it yeah <laughs> welcome to my life um but then the but at the same time I, if you don't if you don't have to there's enough there to kind of not linger in that like you don't have to linger in it I remember Linda Earle, who was a, the director of Skohegan at the time when I made this piece, when I did it at Socrates Sculpture Park, she's like, Karen, I sat on the carousel. When you say this, okay, yeah, you mean the carousel. Yeah, so she's like, I just sat and cried. And maybe some of it might have been tears of sadness, but there's a funny line between that sadness and, and that release of like, I'm really feeling right now. And even if it could be through tears and sadness, feeling is still good. Oh, I believe with that. I believe in that. I mean, I don't, I guess since I mentioned like the one cardinal rules, like I always have to learn something with a show. I always have to be surprised. If I'm not surprised, it's not worth doing. My other cardinal rule for a show is like, um, maybe this is like too much to be uh, revealed or something, but um, yeah. if I don't, if I don't cry, it's not a good show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that can be someone else's show. That can be a show that I've done. That can be the tears can be happy tears they can be bad tears they can be but like if it hasn't mm -hmm. so, something hasn't been stirred up mm -hmm. it wasn't worth doing um mm -hmm. as generally a belief like someone else can do the shows that just keep me interested and keep me going i've only got time for the shows that actually refuse to resolve themselves for me or it shows or, 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 yeah or making work that you trust that you acknowledge that we're complex beings who at every moment your brain could be having multiple thoughts that you can't even catch up with, <laughs> catch up with yeah. that could be conflicting. Like we're complex and, and it's okay. Hmm. All right, we're at 7.55. So I don't, I mean, do you have, do you have last questions, last comments, last things you want to? I'm, I'm you good. should get the last word. You should, or the last, or the last request, or the last request. I'm seeing my, some former students. I'm okay with if someone just wants to blurt out something, unmute themselves and blurt it out. 
<laughs> All right. Are there any the moment to blurt. Uh, are there any blurters? <laughs> no blurters. I see that. Go Trinidad. Yay! <laughs> Trini in the house. You have to give me your corn soup recipe. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, this was great. I'm, 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 I'm honored. I'm honored that I got to work with you. You're like my genius, amazing curator. I just think you're amazing in so many ways. And that's wrong. But this, was, um, this, 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 was super this is going to be the mutual ad admiration society because, like, I'm, I'm the lucky one. So this was a gift. I mean, I'm sad that the show. I hope. I still have a hope that maybe some people will get to see the show. If there could be a sliver of, I don't know, I hope. Oh, I guess I should put a quick plug. Like if somehow this doesn't, if we are not able to reopen, I can say that a version of the show will travel to Buffalo. Um, okay. Dates pending, of course, as all dates are pending in the world. Um, so people, those who are mobile and can mo you know, be mobile, we'll be able to see something there at the University Galleries in Buffalo. And there will be a publication and you are going elsewhere. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you everyone. Could we keep this? I don't, there's lots of chats and I wanna hold, I wanna keep those. Is there a way to do that? To save it? Well, the, the, the conversation. The chat's going to be kept, and we're also going to have a video version of the conversation that will be captioned, um, available on ICA's YouTube page. So all of that will be available um, over the next few weeks. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. This is less, much less awkward than I thought it would be because of you, Anthony. Well, it's 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 still weird. To, like I, I miss, I miss our hand gestures. Go, you know, interfering know. with we each other. We both have miss. hands going. And the hug at the end. I missed the hug yeah. at the end. <laughs> and they're like, look at your pants. Look at your pants. Look at your pants. Look at your... Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>